Hi, Sue Borison from Your Teen Media. Today I'm here with Dr. Suzanne Schnepps, a clinical psychologist who's been in practice for over 30 years. Thank you for being here, Suzanne. Thank you for having me. So today I want to talk about, you know, we've done a lot of hearing that we should rise to the occasion and bring grace and um, and all of that is so inspiring until we can't live up to it. So one of the things we keep hearing from our parents is, I, I call it the defiant teen. Now, they probably were like that beforehand, but now we are locked in a space together. So what do we do as parents when it's, it, you know, the, the Facebook pictures are all looking like everyone's having so much fun and you're coming home and every time you say something to your kid, they sneer at you, they ignore you, they slam a door. Like, what do you do with that? First of all, we all have to remember, most people are not putting on Facebook. I screamed at my kid. I threw a cauliflower at their head. I just couldn't stand it anymore. I just stood in the kitchen and went, ah! Most people are not doing that, okay? And everybody has their moment. So the first thing that I think is really, really important is I hear from more kids that the most important way that a parent can handle themselves is to apologize. It means so much to kids when we as grown-ups say, you know, I messed up. I, the feelings are getting so big, I, I didn't handle it well, and I apologize. That means a great deal. But to think that you could be perfect during this time is an absolute, it's one of the few things I could guarantee. I don't think anybody could be perfect. It's just too hard. And I think when you live with a kid who has been challenging all along, it makes it even more, more difficult. Um, you know, I think we need to look at what is that? Who is that defiant kid? And just like before, the question is, why are they being defiant? You know, are they being defiant because they're scared? And, you know, if you're scared and you've had a, a challenging relationship with your family, and you go to the challenging relationship and you call your mother a few interesting names and you call your father a few more interesting names, you change the set. Now we don't have to be worried about the coronavirus. We can be in a fight with our parents. And actually that's familiar. And we really know they love us. And in the end, all will be okay. So, you know, some of it is about being scared. Some of it's about being sad. Some of it's about being disappointed. Some of it's about the uncertainty. The, you know, why is the defiance increasing? If we haven't gotten to the core of the problem beforehand, um, and it's, it's so exacerbated right now, is there a place now to be able to try and kind of peel back the layers and see what's causing it? Some kids might be interested in that experience, and it's it, you know it's it's a chance to try to do it, but to think under extreme stress that they all the defiant kids are going to let us know what this is all about is probably unlikely. You can reach for it, but kids totally hate when we reach for it too many times. You know, even if I do that as a clinician, it's like, stop being a psychologist. It's enough already. Just talk to me. I really am only upset, you know, that I can't go to my, you know, dance tonight. Okay, let's just talk about that. I, I think the one thing they, that parents can try to do is to empathize. This is really hard. I mean, it's hard for all of us, but it's especially hard when you were the defiant teen who was used to many times escaping <laughs> and there's no escape, you know, they're, they're stuck, they're stuck there. I, I think that parents want to think about what's most important now with the defiant teen. Um, I've been asked to house several of them, um, you know, <laughs> and, you know, let's be real. They would be lovely for me for about two days. And then they would revert to the same defiant behavior. I think we have to keep in mind with the defiant team, the most important thing is that we try to emphasize the need for safety. The rest of it, it's small stuff. We got to give it up. So as a parent, it's like, you know, the, the, your room isn't clean. 
it, it's fine. It'll get clean another day. See, I, I, don't you think know. That's, I think that's the easy one. I think the, the harder one is that often that child can come into a, a family situation and disrupt the whole family. So if, if we're trying to do something fun for a moment and that keeps getting stolen, like it's not the, the messy room, fine, close the door, but how about the bigger things? Okay, they don't wanna have fun. They don't wanna participate. So the first thing is to ask, do they wanna participate or would they prefer not to? And give them a choice. There's no control in any of this. So anything you can give control of, and they don't want to participate. They do not want to play family trivia. They do not want to play Monopoly. They don't want to see the same movie. It's okay. Give them a choice. But, the, but then we have to look at the fact that, you know, you're trying to at least have some semblance of enjoyment and they come down and they start one of their deals about anything. You know, if we go back, go back for a second to our two-year-old and they have, you know, like you've been, it's been going really well. And then you give them the blue cup and they wanted the red cup. Something would tip them off, okay? The same is true with the defiant team. What, one of the things that seems to be somewhat helpful is to say, we need some space and, and the rest of us are gonna go for a drive. You're, you're welcome to come, but I'm thinking maybe you need space too. You can stay here and we're gonna go for a family drive and to try to really give some separation because we're still allowed to be able to do that. That the, seems to me that that sets alarms for me that the other message we might be sending is there's us and there's you. So how we invite them to come. We invite them to come. We're all going to go to get out. Would you like to join us? Mm -hmm. We don't. That's an outstanding point because the defiant teen will frequently say nobody likes me. Actually, nobody loves me is really more to the point is what they what they say. They love my sister, my brother, everybody better. They don't love me. So one of the things that I've suggested to a few parents is that we live to do a few kindnesses. OK, you know, um, I call it running the Ritz Carlton, um, you know, um, it, bring, say tomorrow is breakfast in bed. What's the difference? You know, a little orange juice, whatever you happen to have in the house, um, a little piece of candy that you put on their pillow with a little note that you love them. Um, and does it work? It helps for the second because they're hurting so much that the hurt just doesn't go away. But for the second, they get to see that, that, they're, that they're cared about. We always invite them. It's their choice whether they come. It's their choice. Okay, they so they choose to come and mm -hmm. take and, and take it down. Like the whole experience is taken down. Now what? And that, and we say, well, that was really disappointing. I mean, you know, we give it all our great words, you know, as if it and we're thinking we're we're thinking one thing. We're thinking, I can't believe I decided to invite them and they've ruined it and I needed to get out. But we say, This is so disappointing. I guess we're gonna turn around. I guess this just didn't work. We get out of the car. And we hope that they get out of the car too, and that maybe it's calm for a minute. I think what I'm trying to say, maybe not so successfully, is there isn't any magic, okay? They were challenging before, and now they're confined. And the confinement escalates that, feel I mean, they've, we, we all know about feeling trapped. They feel super trapped because they're trapped within themselves, which is the part we have to remember. This comes from a place that's really hard. And does a kid like this, like if we, if we ask them to, to do us a favor, does that work? No. <laughs> Why should I do you a favor? You don't love me. You love Sally and George so much more. Why don't you ask them to do me a favor, Sue? Me, I'm not gonna do you a favor. The nerve of you, okay? Okay, so you can't implore them to be behave a little differently just to do, to be kind, or that doesn't work. Absolutely not. Now, if, <laughs> if you're lucky enough to see a moment or two of kindness, which by the way, I think they do do, 
I think what happens is, in, is the age old. Oh, thank goodness they weren't calling me any of those names. It was so nice. It was like a fine meal. Nobody didn't say anything wrong and they didn't get off on their high horse. We forget to say, I really enjoyed that meal with you. You know, that was really pleasant. And, you know, it's, it's hard to remember that, but any time that we can, you know, that old thing that we've all learned, you know, man, you know, stroke the positive really helps so much. Um, it doesn't mean that five seconds later, they're not going to be really upset and defiant. Okay. But I mean, there is, there is this um, underlying sense of continually showing love that I appreciate hearing. Yes. And they really, really, really need to hear that because they're really hurting. They're all good kids. They're just really hurting and they're, they haven't worked out before what some of the issues are. And m most of them will not right now want to work them out. Now, I will tell you that there have been a couple of kids who've totally and completely surprised me that uh, remotely as we're working, um, have wanted to look at some of the harder issues, but it's hard for them then to sustain it. But um, as one of the kids said to me recently, it's a time for so much self-reflection because I'm alone. <laughs> yeah. And so it does, it, so it's, there's two pieces of that. One is it's stirring up whatever was underlying the defiance. And two, it's like, the resources to work it out are, are different than they've been in the past. So that raises a really good point. Do, do, are there particular types of personalities that are more inclined to blame it on someone else and not be able to look inside? Like, is that, is a defiant kid more likely to let, to say, to push it outward instead of looking inward? They might. They, they might, they might be willing to look, you know, they, they vary. It's like not one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, the defiance is a way to externalize what they're feeling internally. And so that's their pattern and the general way that they've always probably handled themselves. The, the other part is, remember, many of our defiant kids go to school and they're lovely. The teachers just say, <laughs> Who are you talking about? You know, um, and parents have said, well, why don't we get some of that time? Mm -hmm. Well, you probably do get some of that time, but because of the close quarters and because of the fact that it's 24 seven together, you're probably not noticing those small times. Mm. That's great. So pay attention to the small times if you can catch them. Yes. That's great. Yeah. So I want to go back to something you said, just because I, I, um, I've always laughed at this. I have five kids and, mm -hmm. um, and I feel like I have so much restraint in the, like the thoughts that race through my head. I, I say 10% of what I want to say. And oh, my, maybe less, maybe less, maybe less. And my kids will go, Oh my God, you always say that. <laughs> <laughs> So when you, when you said, like, you know, you don't, you, you made reference to it earlier. It made me think about the fact that there's so much restraint going on, and yet it's still too much for our kids. Right. And they capital, okay, and what they would say is exactly the same thing to us, including the defiant team. You just don't know how many times I wanted to say some horrible, horrible, horrible thing, and I didn't say it. And it's the same is true for me. And to some degree, that's true. That, yeah, but you, you know, don't, you don't get credit for what you didn't say. No, you don't. <laughs> and if you were to say, let me tell you what I wanted to say, but I didn't say it, that'll go really poorly. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, so can and we it's, I think I just was going to say, I think it, it's remembering to forgive ourselves for what we say. Can we end with one, like the, the big message you want to give to parents who are, are living with that type of child in their house right now and really struggling right now? I guess my biggest message would be, let's see, how about forgive yourself for when you have a moment. Work really hard to find the moments to be positive with them. Try very hard to let them know that you love them and don't do the, 
I love you, but I don't like your behavior because that's, we got it. We're past that now, but to let them know how much you do love them and how much, you know, it's really, really, really a hard time. And it's so uncertain. And that uncertainty makes everybody anxious. There's one thing that we can maybe hold on to for some hope, which is that there will be a vaccine. It is so likely that they will develop something that will make this COVID-19 not something that we need to be afraid of for the future long term and to hold on to that hope. Thank you so much, Dr. Suzanne Schnapps. Thank, thank you for having me.